Once upon a time. Isn't that how stories are supposed to begin? That is how my mother always began her stories. But why can't they end that way? Because the ending is usually when the promise of everlasting happiness is proclaimed. What are stories if not the memories of our people? And if memory is any clue, there is no guarantee of happiness. Is it just a myth that there is any such thing as happily ever after? Memory is a broken mirror, fragments of reflective glass and fractures of light, gleaming in brilliance for a moment before fading forever into vague washes of soft color and deepening shade. Sometimes, the harder we try to focus on them, the more they fade and slip from our grasp. Beautiful shards that, when taken all together, make us who we are. Memories or dreams. Sometimes it is impossible to tell the difference. Last night in my dreams, a mysterious wizard came to me. He spoke in a foreign voice, a series of strange sounds that formed a single word. In that word was a message that I understood. He said that I had been chosen and at the same time cursed. Lula, he said, because of your gifts of both endurance and vision, you have been chosen to retrieve the sacred relic of your people. The genie. Another wizard, who wants the genie for himself, has cursed you with the inability to run. Even now he makes his way to the top of the mountain to claim it as his own. You must reach the genie before him and learn its purpose, its power. For if he takes possession of it, you will be further cursed with the inability to walk. You and your people will never again be free to choose your own path. So make haste, child. Do not tarry. Though the path is long, it is the shortest. Though the path is not easy, it is simple. Though you walk alone, fear not, I will be with you. But you will soon have an important choice that only you can make, and that choice will make all the difference. Thus, I woke to a morning of light drizzle, and under the soft light of early dawn, began to walk towards the mountain of fire.
Life in the village has fallen out of balance since the genie disappeared. Before then, we had the freedom to choose our own paths in life. But now they are decreed by the shamans when we come of age. There are hunters and fishers, collectors and keepers, weavers and walkers. Only one path has ever been chosen for each person, until me. The shamans decree that I am both weaver and walker. Weavers do not just weave fish baskets and blankets, they are also weavers of words. Poets and storytellers, they keep the history of our people and weave their words into the warp and woof of every textile. Walkers are the wanderers and wanderers, the dreamers and askers of questions. They are the seekers of whatever light they may find to illuminate the darkest corners of hearts and minds. Of all that have walked away from the village, none have returned. This left path feels right.
came down like tears from the night, as if the sky itself were racked by her sorrows, seized in the rictus of the dead, their coronal pallor, lily cold, white as whales, convalescing ten thousand feet too deep. Is it horror or beauty they feel, or are they the same things? end of feeling, perhaps mercifully, perhaps tragically? I had seen death and wondered what it was. I have been there to hold the dying when the shamans pressed a finger to their mouths and whispered them away. We each imagine something different for them, whatever soothes the heart, but I fear that death is nothing. How can we know? It seems impossible to imagine the end of imagination, to think of the end of thought. The answer to the mystery of death may be in the answer to the mystery of life. are waiting for a sign, a sign in their long slumber to wake them from dream. The shamans say that the gods fell asleep long ago, before the time of people, when there was nothing but stars in the darkness. In their sleep, they dream the world and us into being. It's a pretty myth, but I wonder if it's true. And if so, what happens when they wake?
but this brought her great sorrow because she was certain she was a weaver. She felt cursed. She longed for the return of the genie so she could decide her own path.
because she speaks sometimes when she sleeps, entire worlds in strange articulations that sound out the heart in more uncommon clarity than my most awkwardly acrobatic didactics. Because she sleeps, sometimes when she dreams, entire worlds with certain gesticulations, her hands seemingly demonstrating a moth stricken by her charmingly unconventional inventions. Because she dreams, sometimes when she speaks, entire worlds unintentionally expressing in one simple sound why anyone, anywhere, ever, For ten long winters, I've pondered her questions. Is life just a long goodbye? A brief, bright spark of imperfection disturbing the twin expanses of otherwise perfect, infinite nothing? Maybe that's why the shamans deemed her a walker and not a weaver. She had no answers, only questions. Questions that can only be answered by walking on the path a journey to find some mystery to fill the cracked vessel of her heart, a journey to find the genie. But what is the genie? How could it make a difference in the freedom to choose our own paths in life? What power did it hold? And who made it? I could only hope that these questions and more would be answered when I found the genie. I daydreamed about what it would look like. I do not know how far I have yet to travel, or if ever I will find it. I worry that I have chosen the wrong path, but there is no turning back now.
As a young girl, my best friend was Rofesso, a cobbler's son. He had no interest whatsoever in shoes or the making of them. We would meet in the blue fields, throw off our shoes and run. We ran until dusk and returned home only for supper, with feet filthy, our shoes lost. As we grew, our friendship also grew into affection and ultimately a deep abiding love. The kind of love that knows you are only half of a whole. Let's jump across the gap. As we grew, Rofesso would often take to sitting and staring into the faraway distance. There was a longing in his eyes, and I could feel sadness in him. I would take his hand and sit for hours in silence. On one such occasion, as we watched the sun setting, the late summer breeze in our hair, he looked at me and kissed me on the forehead. He said, I have to go. My heart collapsed in my chest.
unable to stifle the tears. All I could say was, I know. As he rose to depart into the great unknown, I asked, Aren't you afraid of being alone? Yes, he said. My fear is great that I may never see you again. But the fear of living an empty and meaningless life is far greater. Forgive me, Lula. He turned and began to walk away from me. I said, I will watch you until I can't see you anymore. And I did. blankets me. Such funny sounds you made as we lay on carpets of moss. You put a flower in my hair and marveled at your work. I suffered sweetly your platitudes and knew you would be forever unmoved by me. Forever, you whispered, your breath brushing my lips. I was there, undone in fistfuls of flowers. Alone, I tremble. I wonder if my mother came this way, with her blank brown eyes starved wide, rude pale her meager frame. I remember once she said to me, in a perfect world, I'd make you princess of something, I suppose, and strictly forbid poems. Sweetly she sighed, but fearful to look upon, thin as cracked lips curling painfully up at the edges. I am only air, swelling her organ mouth. Trembles her garden, black with forgotten orchids. I think of stairs where you padded softly, of terminal halls where you paced out the heart. In father's own hut, a wooden vault with dust and black willows scraping the walls. In your dull, empty room, an insurgent sun flickering again, fed on dry fumes. Yet something soon takes flight, and she rises sweetly again to nocturnal indigo marches.
trembles the air about you. Nothing but embers, her love violet with twilight. With a turn of the neck and a tilt of the chin, she learns of stars that burn in chaos begetting entire worlds. We learn there is no such thing as beginning and end. Would you, in your wise, wide eyes, deliver to me in my outstretched hands a stone? Crochet me into your sleep, weaving dreams and poetry from this darkly fraying patch. Don't let it take all your life to learn you were alive, she said to me one drizzly dawn. How my blood swelled with you. In your world, you must be a thousand feet tall, stunned by your own grandeur. Angled, mystical, not ungraceful, Colossus. You dismiss me with coolly delivered denouement. You always knew the proper place to end a poem. I feel you wringing them out, leaving the universe crippled in comparison. If you will, tear the sky and be satisfied. I never said you were beautiful, but my hands may know the texture of closed eyelids, jawline, and perhaps that cheekbone you furrowed with creaks, afraid of only age, of yawning paralytic time, and the absolute center you could forever unfind and otherwise trusted mirrors. I cannot reach this thing inside. Instead, hope falls through your trembling fingers, confounding even the sky. You taught tender, while stuffing softer hearts with bitter. From where I am, sepulchral among howling stones, your autumn leaf hands I would have held. Hoping to salvage a wraith-wracked spirit, will you not cry out? Will you not lay claim to these sedimentary spaces? Will you not stand and cry, this, this, and this is mine, this only I can fill. My tears cannot be heard in such silence.
Burn on fragile Phoenix. Burn. Done with it. You wept for your own unfulfilled sovereignty. Your mourning wild with twilight. I would have held you when the floods came, gently rocking the terrors. I could have delivered you in your ashes from the salty waste you consumed with fury. Bend never again to this wound. Still you bend clutching your sides, prevailing in chaos, then slowly turn and look at me and say nothing. Still I wander this dark world, bootless on Blackthorn, adrift on an empty sea. I wonder if she walked this way, by what dreams lulled. I see her slender fingers, chewed up nails and all, trying to humbly fit themselves around gigantic teacups. There is something in it that makes me sad. I just wish I could tell you. I wish I could have told you. Maybe together we could have understood. I saw a time when we gathered together in animal skins, hunched over fires in ancient caves, and murmured a millennial conversation. Under the aegis of leaf wine, I gather my furs about me and stare into the flames. A torch song of fire opals, languid as salamanders, a writhing nest of fire snakes, lazy ribbons of flame. A dream within a dream, lovelier than death, more beautiful than night. It seems there was something we knew then, something important, long forgotten. What mysteries scrawled on cave walls to speak across the great spans of time? What heavy knowledge we ignored for so long that now it is too late? 
Or perhaps it is nothing. Every generation thinks themselves the cleverest yet. Perhaps they are just childish doodles from a simpleton folk, unable to render accurately even what they saw with their own eyes. I dreamed I was entombed, and Mother pulled back the heavy stone lid of the sarcophagus. She said, I'll not leave you on some high grid for the vultures to pick at. Child from my womb, a corpse in the tomb, my brittle pristine, I've come to clean the spaces between bare knuckles and gold rings. Fear not the worms, for we are vermivorous even in long sleep. Fear not in your languid vertebrae. I've come to make scarabs of us. Often when it rains, I think of the fisher. He is a solitary man who lives outside the village in a tiny hut he made himself on the shoreline of the sea. He would spend long days casting his line in the waters, his skin brown from the sun. I never saw him wear shoes, and his clothes were nearly the rags of a beggar. His hair and beard were long and unkempt, as if never cut or combed once in his life.
The fisher never took a wife, and he had no children. No one knows from where he came. The villagers thought him eccentric, perhaps mad. He never ate the fish he caught, but traded them with the villagers for the simple goods of survival. I once saw him pick a grasshopper from a swaying reed, hold it gently in his hand as if marveling at its construction. Then he dabbed it with a bit of wild honey he had gathered and ate it whole. Once the fisher brought a line of beautiful fish to my father to trade for a basket. The fish were worth more than one simple basket, so my father offered him a net that he could use to catch more fish. He refused, saying, Each fish is unique. They must be caught individually or not at all. So my father offered him a variety of baskets to keep the fish separate. Again he refused, saying, Once I have gathered them, I must carry them all together, or not at all. I grew curious about the fisher, so one day I decided to go watch him fishing and perhaps speak with him. I sat on a rock not so far behind him. He didn't turn or look at me, but gazed far into the clear blue sky of the summer day and said, Looks like rain today. Where are your shoes, child? It did not look like rain. I answered his question with one of my own. Where are your shoes? He replied, I never had a need of them. And the path goes on and on and on.
When one walks deliberately, with purpose and care, they have no need of shoes. But you, you run all the day long without shoes, not because you don't need them, but because you like to feel the ground beneath your feet, even if it hurts you sometimes. I thought how this was true, a truth I had not even thought of myself. The villagers think you are a half-mad hermit, I offered. He laughed and cast his line again. I suppose they may be right. If my concern for the world about me, being greater than my concern for myself, is madness, then yes, I am mad, he continued. We should never want for more than we need, for that is the beginning of the end. The collecting of things beyond our need is, to me, the truer madness. In the endless collecting of things, we become heavy and burdened with possessions. After a time, it is the possessions that possess us. Consider the fishes, he said. They have no possessions and so can flit about on the waters, light and unburdened, free to swim anywhere. If they had possessions to carry, they would sink and die. This seemed obvious enough to me. Fish can't carry things anyway. Consider also the story of a king I once knew. I quietly laughed, as if the mad fisher cavorted with kings. I thought this very unlikely.
This king was master of all he surveyed, he went on. He gathered to himself all the riches and fine things of the world. His every desire was met, but still he wanted more. Possessed with accumulation, he neglected his kingdom, even his wife and only son. The more he gained, the more he wanted. He piled up all his treasure in a great storeroom and locked it away. But one day, his young son found the key and entered the chamber. The king heard a loud crash and ran to the treasure room. There he saw a great avalanche of gold falling on his son and crushing him. Try as he could, he could not pull the boy from the heavy flood. He dug and dug in the gold, but his son was lost. Too late did he feel the love he had for his only son. In the collecting of things, he ignored the only thing that really did matter. The king was consumed with grief and vowed to never possess another thing that he didn't need. He gave away all his treasure to the poor people of the kingdom and set out alone to live a life free of possessions. Was this mad fisher once a king? I found it very doubtful. You see, Lula, he said, we often learn too late what is really important in life. There is an old saying that the owl of wisdom only spreads its wings at twilight.
What does it mean? I asked. He replied, It means that we only learn the valuable lessons when it is too late. We only decide to change when we are forced into it, with our backs against a wall. We can change at any time if we choose to, but we usually don't until it becomes necessary. In any event, there is always hope. And with that, I heard the sudden rumble of thunder as dark clouds suddenly gathered in the sky, and it began to rain. The fisher turned his face up to the sky and smiled into the rain. At last he turned to me with his wild but knowing eye and said, Seek the middle way, Lula. Between all and nothing, find the middle way. But know that you will not find it out in the world. It is in a secret place that only you can find. And the greatest secret of all is that there is no secret. You will find the genie, and when you do, you will understand even the dreaming gods. I have to jump across.
I knew, he was truly mad. It made no sense. A secret? That there is no secret. But he spoke to me of the genie long before my dream where the wizard told me to find it. Was it a dream? I can't remember. For all I know, it was real and I am dreaming now. Are we all asleep and dreaming the world? Are the gods real? It is all beginning to confuse me very much. I can only hope that he was right about the genie. I should much like to reach the mountain before winter falls. I wonder if my mother came this way. Did she brave the storms and lean into the wind, pressing on? Turning back never seems an option, I know, having come this far myself. Sometimes in the wind, I think I can hear you singing to me. You sing the rains. You sing the snows to me. It makes me brave against the elements. How my mind has frozen on you, on a soul beautiful as first frost. I am snow blind, mad without footprints. Your coronal pallor, contoured and torpid as an angel's trumpet. I close my eyes and imagine you alone in a forest chapel, watching the snows fall on midwinter's eve. You see me through the window standing alone in the dark pines, storm-torn and buffeted by the winds. You see me and slowly draw the curtains.
I lean into the cold and think of the pale promise locked in winter. Though it is the dying of summer, the quietly encroaching cold hiding in leaves, it holds the expectancy of spring. A diminuendo of green sadly passes, but will keep warm the winter long and clutch the memory of warmth in our hearts. Though spring promises nothing of herself in returns, and summer swears no shrift of conscience in its leave-taking, we sing. come to regret that we rude the florid heat of summer, even as it slips always away again. We may yet sing of birth and rebirth, as the new grass lights the air and meadow birds sing with us. Winter groans in sheets of ice and burdens of snow, but in that voice we hear the promise of spring. With mittened hands cupped against the cold, we sing of life and light again the candles of hope. Much left, I guess. those who simply never choose a path. They know that neither extreme is balanced, that they cannot find the middle path, and so they become frozen 
in a stasis of indecision. Distracted by anything and following the whims of the day, they seek to fill the emptiness with any passing fancy. They too seek the genie, but they do not know why, and so become lost. Even with unmoving eyes they see me. They would eat me alive if they could. I often think of my very first memory as a child. It was the spring thaw, when the blankets of snow began to melt, the sun shined its warmth, and the birds began to sing again. In my mother's frozen garden was a stone that had cracked, buckled by the cold. And there in the crack was a single tiny white flower, a bloom of only four petals, it bravely opened to face the world and greet the sun, as if in defiance of death itself. I knelt by the little snow flower and wondered at it. Here was life in the midst of frozen nothingness. It seemed precarious, tender, so unlikely in its setting. But there must be some hidden strength in it to have emerged here, overcoming the elements and the odds. It seems a fortunate incident of nature, like life itself, perhaps not magical, but wonderful that it has occurred.
even at that age, the flower made me ponder the teachings of the shamans. They told of how the world is dreamed up by the sleeping gods, and that when, when we die, we will join them in their dream of paradise and live forever. But I have seen birth and death and know that they are different. I witness the workings of the world and think it natural, not the magical dreaming of imaginary gods. I cannot tell my thoughts to anyone. They would think me blasphemous or even mad to question the shamans. They would think I had lost sight of the truth, of the mysterious, magical workings of life itself. They would think me irreverent, at the very least. But it is not so. Considering the triumph of the tiny flower in the midst of a frozen garden, I have a profound reverence for the unlikely presence of life. That life is simply magic is, to me, of less value than if it developed as an inevitability in the infinite spans of time, and gained a foothold enough to thrive against all the odds. Life is a champion of chance. There is more awe and wonder in this truth than to simply dismiss it as the providence of some great and mystical unknowable. It is made all the more special by its unlikelihood.
There we go. Tucked between twin expanses of endless nothing, here, for a brief and shining moment, is something rare and beautiful life. It sings in me, and I know that I am. Joy fills my heart, and I know that I will never squander a moment of life, however long or brief it may be. We live, we laugh, we learn and grow old. We love and we die. Between birth and death, we have this one chance to just let it be beautiful. cracks open and falls to the ground, the world trembling with change. I have no fear. I feel that soon my path will end, and I know not what I will find. But I have had this time, this one chance to truly be alive. I have lived and loved. Along with heartache and loss, I have known beauty and joy. Even if the end is upon me, I consider how fortunate I've been to have this one brief, shining moment. I have lived, and that is more than enough. I found no answers along the path, only more questions. What is the genie? What does it do? Who made it, and where is it from? I shall soon find out. Perhaps it will answer all my questions. I have considered that it may pose more questions than answers and feel that somehow I already know the answers. And now I see. must be the genie, solid, inanimate, but somehow organic. And there, next to it, stands the wizard that spoke to me in my dreams. As I draw nearer, I can hear his voice again, that strange sound with unmoving lips that I can understand his words. Lula, he said, you have made it to the mountain of fire and now stand before the genie. You have chosen to face your fears along the shortest path. In facing the darkness of your mind, you have conquered yourself. You have learned that the answers to your questions are within you. You have learned hope. The path you have chosen is the shortest path, and so you are victorious. Your arrival precedes that of the other wizard who sought to curse you.
still he wanders the other path, having chosen what he thought was the easiest way. Now you may lay your hand on the genie, and the program will continue. Program? I asked. I don't understand. What is the genie? The genie, he began, is a computational construct, what we call a processor. As an operating administrator, I have introduced a packet of data into the genie. It arranges the data into information that runs a program. This program is called Lula. Your first moment of being was just before you chose the path. You see, Lula, he continued, this world and everything in it, all your memories and dreams, your mother, your father, and Rofesso have been created by you. You have arranged the data into a stream of consciousness that will not become real until you lay your hand on the genie and verify the information. You will return to your village where your mother and father happily await you. The program will be set and will continue to run indefinitely. Your people will be free to choose their own paths in life. You will forget that you began as a program. You will be free to run anywhere you like, to live the life you choose and grow old. Free to laugh and learn and perhaps most importantly, you will be free to love. What about the other wizard, I wondered? Once you verify, he replied, the bug in the system that you think of as the other wizard will be deleted. Thank you for this learning experience. How could I choose otherwise? I slowly reached out my hand and laid it on the genie. It felt warm, humming with life. I see the world I have created as it becomes real. I feel myself forgetting that it started as a program. What does it matter? I will be with my mother and father again. We will be free and happy. And now I have a story to tell. Was it a dream or a memory? I do not know, but let it begin. Once upon a time, 